Okay, so now that we've come to understand terms like multipolarity and heteropolarity, how can we use them to make sense of the transformation of the global media landscape today? And what does this transformation mean in the context of war? First of all, we need to distinguish between what people call old and digital new media. Old media, like the printing press, radio, television, at its heart displayed a fundamental division between sender and receiver. A division which for a long time had structurally, materially and politically conditioned the nature of the relationship between old media and war. Since 2002, we have seen the emergence of so-called digital new media, like Web 2.0, smartphones, social media apps like Facebook and Twitter. Within digital new media technology, however, this age-old separation between sender and receiver has been eroded. The interactive nature of digital new media allows everyone to be a sender and receiver at the same time. Thus, alongside traditional media platforms, an entirely new form of media technology has arisen. This is not to argue that traditional media has disappeared. These media formats are still around, of course, and they remain politically powerful and important. But it has been supplemented by a newer, dissimilar form of media technology. And this development has transformed the multipolar nature of the old media landscape and has led to a heteropolar global media landscape in which the age-old relationship between media and war has been altered. So, today's global media landscape is no longer characterized by similarity, but by difference. Not by multipolarity, but by heteropolarity. This seismic shift in the global media landscape requires us to redefine our understanding of the nature of the relationship between media and conflict today. And to do this, we first examine the old multipolar media landscape and its relationship with war. We then look at today's heteropolar media landscape and how it has altered the relationship between media and war. So let's start with the historic relationship between conventional old media and violent conflict. To examine this relationship, it is helpful to draw our attention back to two early forms of mass communication. The Renaissance fresco painting and the 18th, 19th century panorama. At first sight, these two media formats might strike us as odd and antiquated choices, given that we tend to associate so-called old media more strongly and more intuitively with, say, the printing press, radio or television. Yet, both the painting and the panorama were not only, at their time, state-of-the-art media platforms employed to turn war into a form of mass entertainment. More importantly, they also functioned along the very same technological lines as their more familiar successors in 19th and 20th century media. They thereby usefully illustrate important political dimensions of media with regards to war that we see again in other traditional media platforms. Let's start with the large fresco painting. And that takes us to Leonardo da Vinci. One of the greatest artists and inventors of the Renaissance, da Vinci abhorred war because of its beastly madness. And yet growing up in Renaissance Italy with its city-states frequently at war with one another, he couldn't avoid becoming intricately drawn into this beastly madness in and through his work. As a scientist and inventor, da Vinci designed numerous weapons, including missiles, grenades and even modern style tanks. As an artist, he was commissioned to draw numerous large frescoes on the walls of Florence's Palazzo Vecchio, which depicted famous battle scenes to commemorate military victories against rival city-states. Like the famous Anghiari fresco depicting Florence's victory over Pisa in 1440. 
For da Vinci, the painting represented the supreme form of all artistic endeavors because of its ability to demonstrate all the visual effects in the world in terms of their underlying causes. And as a teacher, he instructed young artists in the proper ways in which painters should convey the myriad actions and emotions associated with Renaissance warfare. Some of these detailed instructions survived until today in his notebook called The Way to Represent Battle. Here, da Vinci methodologically catalogued all the things an artist of his time should include in a painting that purported to depict warfare as it really was. Represent first the smoke of the artillery, mingled in the air with the dust tossed up by the movement of horses and combatants. Let the air be full of arrows in every direction, some shooting upwards, some falling, some flying level. The balls from the guns must have a train of smoke following their course. And if you make anyone fallen, you must make the mark where he has slipped on the dust turn into blood-stained mire. Make a horse dragging the dead body of his master. Make the conquered and beaten pale, with brows raised and knit. Show someone using one hand as a shield for his terrified eyes, with the palm turned towards the enemy. Others in the death agony, grinding their teeth, rolling their eyes, with their fists clenched against their bodies, and the legs distorted. You may see some maimed warrior fallen on the ground, covering himself with his shield, and the enemy bending down over him and trying to give him the death stroke. There might also be seen a number of men fallen in a heap on top of a dead horse. And see to it that you paint no level spot of ground that is not trampled with blood. Da Vinci's instructions display the awareness of a master artist who understood the centrality of large fresco paintings in visualizing and emotionally representing war to a wider public. This is significant because prior to the invention of the printing press, radio and satellite, paintings and frescoes constituted the main medium for which political violence was mediated. Let's turn to the second example. In June 1787, some two centuries after da Vinci scribbled his notes, Robert Barker received the official patent for a new art form which was to replace the large fresco painting as the predominant mass medium, the panorama. Etymologically stemming from the two Greek words pan, meaning all, and horama, meaning viewing, the panorama was a technical term describing an enormous painted canvas which reproduced a 360 degree view. The panorama afforded the possibility to relive the experience of a scenic view from a summit. As a visual experience, the panorama was one of the first forms of illusionary space entertainment forming the first virtual mass medium of the industrial age. With its capacity to liberate human vision, it became the 18th and 19th century forerunner of today's movie and IMAX theaters. The panorama proved so popular with the bourgeois masses that it quickly spread from Leicester Square in London and the Champs-Élysées in Paris to the rest of Europe and throughout North America. What is most fascinating, however, is how this state-of-the-art medium became interlinked with politics and, in particular, with war. In 1810, the panorama in Paris presented a vista of the Battle of Wagram, a battle which Napoleon had won the previous year. Napoleon came to see it and appeared highly gratified by his depiction as a military hero. Afterwards, he gave instructions for the design of 14 panoramas to display glorious French victories across his empire. The propagandistic value of the panorama as a mass entertainment medium glorifying war was not lost on other political leaders. Throughout the 19th century, around 400 panoramas were built, and 90% of them displayed war themes. 
making the panorama the precursor of the weekly newsreels shown in cinemas during the Second World War. Both the painting and the panorama were, at their time, state-of-the-art media platforms employed to turn war into a form of mass entertainment spectacle. In this, both mediums displayed the very same characteristics as other mass media platforms that emerged in forms of the printing press in 1439, the mechanical telegraph in 1794, electromagnetic waves in 1896, radio after World War I, television after World War II, and the first version of the Internet called Web 1.0, which became publicly available in 1994. But in addition, and most fundamentally, underpinning all these old mediums was a division between sender and receiver. They were media platforms of mass monologues, one directionally transmitting information generated by very small yet highly specialized and powerful elites to the receiving masses. For the masses of passive receivers themselves, the ability to generate and to transmit information through active participation, through user-generated content or through interactivity only became a possibility in 2002 due to the emergence of Web 2.0. It was only then that the technological preconditions for public media dialogue were created. But until the advent of the dialogical capacities of digital new media platforms, the separation between sender and receiver in traditional media meant that information was only transmitted in one direction. Of course, within the category of the various old media platforms, key differences existed in terms of formats, access, geographical spread, public accessibility or transmission speed. For instance, Da Vinci's fresco painting could only have been viewed by a fraction of spectators compared to the masses listening in to Churchill's famous radio broadcasts during the Blitz, or compared to the global viewers who tuned into CNN's Peter Arnett reporting from a hotel rooftop in Baghdad during the 1991 Gulf War. Equally, while the opening of the new panorama in Berlin in 1812, depicting the burning of Moscow only three months after the real event was celebrated as a sensation in real time, it can hardly compare to the live and instantaneous television broadcasts of 9-11 or shock and awe in 2003. Let alone the difference between still images or prints and the moving images of the newsreel, the cinema and home-owned television sets. On all these levels, key technological innovations have occurred over time that have impacted upon the way in which conflict has been reported and represented. And yet, prior to the advent of the digital media revolution in 2002, all conventional media platforms operated along a common axis the fundamental separation between sender and receiver. And this separation between sender and receiver meant that all media platforms were of the same type structurally. That's why we speak of a multipolar media landscape, a media landscape in which all media poles are structurally similar rather than different. This multipolar old media landscape has had significant ramifications for the relationship between old media and war. But what are these ramifications? And how do they impact upon the broader political dimensions of conflict?